good morning, Calvary. Welcome to worship today. Has anybody been excited or, or happy just about the, the increased freedom that we've had to go out and be a part of society again? I know that I have. As we've had more freedom to go out and be a part of the world in even a small way, I think that the Lord is just drawing us back to this truth this morning, that we are part of his hands and feet, part of his mission for redeeming our families, our workplaces, our schools, and ultimately our city and our nation and the world. So during this time of quarantine, maybe it's been really, really difficult for you. And maybe actually it's been really healing for you. You've been able to rest from busyness. Um, But one thing is true that we've been able to spend a huge amount of time on our internal worlds. And the Lord has been doing a work in our internal worlds and in our homes. But now as things begin to expand, I want us to do this. This morning we worship him, not just because he's worthy, but we worship to contend for what he is doing in our city. And we don't do this by our own power. We don't have the strength. We don't have the authority just to kick down walls of our own volition. But with his Holy Spirit, when his Holy Spirit indwells us, when his Holy Spirit is welcomed into our lives, every ceiling, every capacity, every weakness is covered we're able to bring the kingdom of God into every environment that we go into. So this morning, let's do this. Turn to someone next to you in your home, grab their hand, and just say, you are a carrier of the Holy Spirit. Say that with me. You are a carrier of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Let's get ready to welcome him. God, we say that we love you. Thank you you for the ways that you allow us to partner with you. This morning, would your Holy Spirit be so welcome in our hearts? Would you restore dreams that had died during this time? Would you restore vision where once we were self-focused, God? You are so good. Everybody said, amen. Let's worship you. Nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen. Of the sweetest of loves When my heart becomes free And my shame is undone In your presence, Lord Come on, all around we sing Holy Spirit, you are well Sweetest of loves 
when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone you love your presence Lord all around Holy Spirit you are welcome here come fly this place and fill the your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord, your presence, God. Let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence here and now let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. I'm gonna see 
let's just take a second in our own homes. Let's just lift up our hands just as a sign. We're going to battle in the name of Jesus this morning. We're going to spiritual battle this morning. Every word, every promise of his will come to pass. He takes what the enemy intended for evil and he turns it for good. Come on, with your hands raised, let's prophesy that today. Hey! You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Yeah! You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn surrender every battle, every stronghold, every struggle into your hands this morning. We just take a second to receive the power of the Holy Spirit over our brokenness and our fear and our apathy today. We receive the power of the Holy Spirit church this morning. So glad to have worshiped with you. We are going to be getting started with our message in just one second. Well, good morning. I'm so glad that you guys have joined us here on this Sunday morning. And we're going to be continuing our series on the parables of Jesus and the short stories uh, that Jesus told in the Gospels. And we're going to jump right into this today. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be reading out of the uh, Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 25. So we're going to jump right into this here uh, this morning. It says this starting in verse 25. Large crowds uh, were traveling with Jesus. And turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate their father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, 
even their own life. Such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. Verse 34 says this. Don't miss this. This is so good. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. How many of you guys know uh, that sometimes families uh, can be a difficult, difficult situation? You know, we love our families to death. We love our siblings, our mom and dad. But we all know that sometimes there can be tension uh, in our families. And no matter how much we love them, there can be anger. There can be hurt in our families. But we, we all know and we're all under the assumption uh, that no matter what, we're supposed to love our family. Uh, we're supposed to have their back. We're supposed to ride or die with them. We're supposed to hold on to them no matter what no matter how angry uh, we get. I remember one time when I was younger, um, we were in our house and something broke. I can't even remember what it was, but it was like a glass vase, something that was valuable. And it was one of those situations where nobody knew who did it. Uh, nobody knew what happened. Nobody knew how it broke. Uh, everybody was covering for everybody. And, and in my defense, I honestly had no idea how this thing broke. But the problem was, is that I built up a reputation in my life uh, that I accidentally broke expensive and valuable things around our house. I don't know why. I was careless when I was young. I would throw the ball around a lot when I was a kid. And it was just my reputation that I would accidentally break things sometimes. So everybody assumed that it was me. And my mom came up to me and she questioned me. And I was like, mom, I have no idea. It wasn't me. I have no idea who broke this. Um, And my sister, for whatever reason, She thought it would be funny if she were to forge my signature in my own handwriting and write a handwritten note to my mom confessing that I was the one who broke the vase. And if that doesn't scream who's guilty, I don't know who, uh, what does. Uh, But my mom came and she questioned me and I was blown away. I was like, I didn't write that note either. I didn't break it. I didn't write the note. And in that moment, I've never been more angry uh, at my sister. But we know that when we have times where we're mad at our family, that I love my sister. I love my family and we're supposed to. And I think that's what God wants us to do. But here, Jesus is explicitly telling this group of people, he says, if you don't hate your mother, your father, your brother or your sister, if you don't hate your family, he says, you cannot be my disciple. You cannot be my disciple. And this is wild language. Like, this is really crazy to think about because this is not, this is not Jesus's MO, right? Like, Jesus is all about love. He's all about forgiveness and grace. He's not the type of person who's supposed to be telling people to hate one another. But here we see that Jesus says, if you don't hate these people, if you don't hate your mom and dad, you are not worthy to be my disciple. This is wild. And, and it, it seems so out of line of character of who Jesus is. So what is he saying here? What is Jesus trying to get across? And I think it's really important to look at what is happening a few verses before this. And essentially what's happening is, is that Jesus is in the company of a group of people called the Pharisees. And they are the religious leaders of the day. In a few verses before what we just read, it says that they are watching Jesus carefully. And what that means is that they're watching Jesus to see, does he fit inside their bubble, their group of people, or their circle? Does he fit with their ideology, with their mindset, with their own way of thinking? Because if he does, great. But if he doesn't, they're going to get rid of him. So they're watching him carefully to see, is Jesus somebody that we want to keep around? Does he fit inside of this box that I have created for myself. So I think Jesus is trying to combat that way of thinking. And he's saying that there should be nothing, no one, 
anything that you place at a higher priority than myself. He says, there should be nothing that you love more than me. Your loyalty should only, only first and foremost, go to Jesus himself. So he's combating this this thought process. And I I don't think that Jesus tells us that we really should hate people. I, I really don't think that this is what Jesus is saying here. But I think he's being incredibly serious in saying that there should be nothing that you are more loyal to in your life. There should be nothing that you love more than me. Not even your own family. And I think Jesus understands that our family members, they cannot hold the weight that God holds. They cannot carry the burden that God can carry. They cannot bring us true fulfillment in our lives. They cannot bring us true hope or grace or mercy or a light inside of our lives. We can try and we can place that on them, but Jesus understands that if we try to place them as the God of our lives, that it's only going to lead towards destruction towards them and hurt towards us because they could never live up to the expectation that we want them to live up to. And Jesus says, only I can carry that weight. Only I could take that. So he says that your love should and only be in me and that everything else should be a secondary love because if you put your first love into anything else, it's only destructive to yourself and the people in who you're putting your trust in. So verse 27 says, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Jesus is telling them that all of the plans, all of the things that you love the most in your life, he's telling them that you need to lay those down, that we need to surrender those things and trust in him more than anything else. He says, take up your cross and follow the plan that I have for you, the purpose that I have for you. Everything else should be a secondary option. And this sounds harsh, right? This sounds dramatic. This is, this is, I'm sure, going to bring up a lot of tension in the group of people that he's talking to. But this brings up a lot of tension in my life too, and I'm sure it does for you. I don't know about you, but my, my family is one of the most important things in my life. There is almost nothing that I, I would not do to make sure that I'm taking care of my wife. There's nothing that I would not do to make sure that I'm protecting my wife or providing for her or ensuring that I'm setting us up well for success in the future. I love my wife more than almost anything in the world. And here Jesus is, is telling us that if you do not love him more than your wife, more than your spouse, more than your kids even, He says, you're not worthy to be a disciple of mine. Your biggest priority should be the plans, the purposes, and the person of Jesus. And this is really difficult to swallow. Like if we really think about this, this is a difficult thing to swallow. That the priorities of my kids, of my spouse, of my family members, or anything or anyone else should not be my number one priority. And Jesus, I think he recognizes this tension point. He understands that this is a difficult thing for us to grasp. And he says this in verse 28. He says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? He's telling us, think this through. Before you start following Jesus, before you start going after the things that he wants for your life, before you start giving your attention to him, he says, think this through. This is a big deal. This is going to cost you everything. It requires us to take up our cross, to follow him, to surrender everything at the feet of Jesus. So he says, don't take this decision lightly. Think this through. It's a big deal. So obviously, this is not the most uh, heartwarming or encouraging uh, topic or story that Jesus has shared or the ones that we have gone over. Uh, and Jesus recognizes this tension. And it almost feels, uh, for me at least, it feels like Jesus is almost trying to persuade us not to follow after him. He says, hey, this is probably a really bad idea. Like, don't do this because it's going to cost you a lot. It almost sounds like that that's what Jesus is saying here. And I don't know, uh, there was times in my life when, when I was younger, I didn't like roller coasters when I was young. I was terrified of them. I, was, I, I never wanted to go near any one of them, but all of my friends did. And 
all of my friends, in order to try to convince me to go on a roller coaster, they would give me all of these reasons, except for every reason that they shared made me want to go on the roller coaster even less. They would tell me that it goes so fast, you feel like your face is going to rip off. They would tell you that when you go over the hill, it feels like you're going to fly out of your seat. I'm like, this is, this is not helping, guys. And it seems like Jesus is like one of my friends when I was 12 years old, where he says, hey, you should follow me. It's going to be great. Oh, by the way, you're supposed to hate your mom, hate your dad. It's going to cost you everything. You're going to have to carry a cross it's going to be a huge burden. So you should really think about this first. What is Jesus doing here? Is he try, trying to dissuade us from following after him? And I think there's two verses right at the end that make this entire passage completely make sense and point to the reason of what Jesus is trying to do. And, and for me, when I first read this, I thought it was completely random. I, I had no idea what Jesus was talking about at first. And maybe you thought it was completely random too when he says this. But in verse 34, I'm going to read this again. It says this, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. So what on earth does salt have to do with anything? What is Jesus saying here? What is he trying to tell us? And this sounds very familiar. Maybe you picked it up too, but this sounds very familiar to a passage that Jesus shares in Matthew 5, where it says this, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying that when we surrender everything to him, the things that we love the most and we lay them at Jesus' feet and say, Jesus, I love these things and they're important to me, but you are the ultimate authority of my life and I'm trusting in you more than anything else in my life. He says that when we do that, there is a salty nature that comes about us. Our life begins to be salty. And if you've grown up or if you've been around uh, youth culture at all or young adults at all, you know that being called salty is not a good thing. In fact, it's an insult. Uh, but Jesus means this in the highest, highest praise possible. Because back in their time, salt was incredibly valuable. Salt was used not only to give flavor to foods in ways that other things could not, but more importantly, salt was used to preserve food. They obviously didn't have refrigerators or coolers or, or ice and things like that that they could have on demand. So they would use salt to preserve, the uh, to preserve the life of their food. And this was almost like a lifeline for them. So Jesus is saying here that when you, when you neglect to surrender something to me, when you don't take up your cross and follow me, he says that you are losing the salt of your life. And then if it's lost its saltiness, it says, then, then what's the point? And he says that that salt of our life, it brings hope inside of us. It brings light. It brings grace. It brings forgiveness, not only for us, but for the world around us. And he recognizes that when we put our trust and our faith in other things, when those are the most important things to us, he recognizes that we're taking the salt out of ourselves. He, we're taking the salt out of them and we're becoming destructive to both parties that when we place the priorities of our kids more than the priorities of Jesus, when we think we're actually doing a favor for our kids, it, he says that we're actually destroying them and ourselves. We're removing the salt, the light, the hope, the grace, the truth, and forgiveness from ourselves. So Jesus says that the option, the way that we maintain that salty life is actually reversed in how we would normally think. It's not to pursue the things that we think are valuable, but it's to surrender them to Jesus and allow him to instill that salt into our lives. So the question for you and for me that I have to answer, that you have to answer, that we all have to think about and go through is what are the things in our hearts, in our lives that we are placing as the ultimate authority, the ultimate loyalty and the ultimate love above Jesus? 
And if you've ever tried doing those things, you know that once you try to follow after those things, whether it be success, whether it be your family, whether it be your kids, it always ends up leaving you unfulfilled, hopeless, without light, because you feel like you're never good enough. You feel like you could never reach the level that you need to to become happy or joy-filled. And Jesus recognizes that only he can bring those things that our heart, that our souls desperately need. Our families, even our kids, even our parents cannot hold the weight of God in our lives. So I know for us sometimes in this season, sometimes it's easy for us to put our trust in a political party or a political system. So when we see things that are wrong about our world, when we see things that are not right, um, sometimes we're afraid to speak about them or take action in some way because it doesn't line up with our political party. So we won't do anything. So in those moments, we're deciding that our political party is the ultimate authority of our lives. Or maybe we love our kids more than anything. We want them to succeed. We want them to do well, which is a good thing. And we should go after those things. But when we place them as ultimate authority in our lives, sometimes we forget that what they really need more than anything is the grace and the power and the truth of Jesus and who he is. So we'll place other things like sports and musicals in their lives. And we forget to have them become involved in faith-based communities where they can grow and know who Jesus has created them to be. And we mean the best, we mean the most, but ultimately we're being destructive to ourselves and to the people that we love the most. They can't carry or hold the weight of God. So what are the things that we are trusting in more than Jesus that we're striving for fulfillment or grace in? Jesus says, surrender those at my feet. We can't take Jesus and place him in a box and say, Jesus, if you fit here, then I'll follow you. Jesus requires everything of us. But he promises that if we surrender the things we love the most, he says that salt begins to enter into our lives. There's hope in life. There's light and forgiveness inside of us. And then we have the opportunity to spread that to the same people and the things that we love the most. So the question is, what is your ultimate authority? Is it Jesus Or is it something that's going to lead in destruction and hurt and pain? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much that you are not just a God who asks us to surrender everything to to him without anything. But God, we are able to surrender everything to you because you had first surrendered your everything for us. You died and you rose again to give us light, to give us life, forgiveness, grace, and truth. And God, we are grateful. And God, I pray that we are a people that every day we decide to give our hope, to give our life, to give our hearts, the things that we love the most to you, trusting that you will bring the salt back into our life and into the people that we love the most around us. We praise you, Jesus, in your name. spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life in me yes it did you have been so so kind I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Now it's 
your foe, still you love far from me. You have been so, so good to me. And every season, Lord, when I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. We say, oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Till you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God shadow. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow now. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow, there's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No, 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 no. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up. Come after me, yeah. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down. Come after me, oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found. Leaves 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending Reckless love of God So now we're entering the part of the service where we let go of something, where we give something. And we truly believe that, that when we surrender something um, of ourselves to Jesus, that it, it leads us to action. So we give and we're generous, not because we're trying to get anything from God, but we, we give because of what God has already gave to us. And we know that the resources that we give away um, are, is the way and the means in which that salt is able to bless the lives and the people and the community around us. So let's pray now. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your generosity towards us. God, I pray that we don't give expecting uh, to win any points in your book or to receive anything from you, but God, I pray that we give as a way to thank and to respond to the goodness that you have already provided for us. We pray these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Church, I have exciting news for you. We are going to be coming back together for physical gatherings in just two weeks from today. Right now, we are finishing up construction and installation of our sound and our lighting equipment. And as of right now, we believe we are going to have a certificate of occupancy and have everything up and running and ready to launch in-person gatherings again on Sunday, July 19th. 
And man, oh man, we have been waiting for this. We are now days away from physical gatherings. And man, I cannot tell you just how excited I am. So we're going to be releasing our full uh, detailed plans for exactly what this is going to look like on all of our different platforms. But I wanted to just take a moment to give you some highlights to make sure you're in the loop of what this is going to look like. So we are going to be wearing face coverings during entering, exiting, and singing. And I know that this is not ideal for many of us, but for us, we believe as a church that that coming together, seeing our church family, worshiping, praising, lifting up the name of Jesus is worth a temporary inconvenience. For us, we want best practices, not just bare minimums. And for you, if you're in the place where you don't want to wear a face covering during worship and coming in and out of the building, we totally respect your views. We just ask you continue to get engage with us in our online services which we're gonna to continue to provide and we're gonna provide those with excellence for you. And because you are part of the church, whether you're in engaging online or in person, and so we want you to know that if you are somebody who is sick or you want to limit uh, exposure for you or for your loved ones, we totally, totally respect that. And we support your decision to continue to engage with us online. So let me make sure you know of a couple other things that are gonna be happening. Our service times are going to be changing. They're going to be shifting to 9 a.m. and to 11 a.m. to allow us to time to move people in and out of the building. And, and the reason for the time change is that that's going to allow us to clean the high touch surfaces in our church building and our auditorium in between each service. And, and that's going to take some extra time. Parking, when you show up, is going to be offered every other space to allow for social distancing. When you come in, you're gonna be ushered to a specific seat based on the number of people who are with you. And um, everybody is going to be seated from front to the back of the auditorium. At the end of church, we're gonna release by rows, just like you would at, at like a wedding. And for right now, uh, just while we're getting started, we are not going to have a separate space for kids church, but <clears throat> I want you to know, we are going to have a mother's room that, that you will be able to change any diapers if you need to. And then we're also going to have our brand new lobby space available. And that'll be available if your kids are struggling in service. And here's the thing. You got to know that there isn't going to be any shame if you need to leave the auditorium to exit with your kids. If they're having a difficult time, I got to be honest, I fully expect my kids to end up there at some point couple other things that I want you to know. Volunteers and staff are going to be temperature checked before they can serve. Seats in the auditorium are going to be set up six feet apart, set up in twos, fours, and sixes for seats there. And for you, you're going to pre-sign up for church before attending to make sure we've got a space and a seat for you. We'll open up signups one week before service starts. So in other words, you would sign up up to seven days before the coming service. And so what that means is that this coming Sunday, you can sign up for physical gatherings of church, which are going to happen in two weeks from now. And we're going to be releasing a, a lot more details of our plans. We're going to have a website with kind of answering all of your questions. And honestly, you might hear some things repeated and for us, we want to make sure that you know exactly what to expect when you show up. So this is just kind of an introduction to the plan. And I just want to take a moment right now to celebrate that we're going to have the chance to be back to in-person gatherings. So church, whether you're joining us online or in person, I want you to know this. I miss you. I love you. I'm praying for you regularly. I believe that for so many of us, this has been such a difficult season. I know for myself, tears have, have trickled down my face when I think about the loss of so much, so many of us have experienced. But I also want to say this, God has done some remarkable works in the midst of this season. And God isn't done yet. With God, there is still a next. And I believe God is going to continue to impact our town, our city of Chilai, using 
our church as a location to be sent out into our world. I think God is still moving in Rochester and I believe he's got plans for the world. I believe he has plans to redeem all of creation, to bring us back to him. And the beautiful part about who God is, is he uses us to be his conduits of change in our world. So please keep in touch with us on our website, check your email, check our social media accounts, and please join us online this coming Sunday, July 12th, for our last week of service times at 9.30 and 11 a.m. with a special pastoral conversation with Pastor Bob regarding this whole COVID-19 season. I will see you guys soon and God bless you.